Everybody got some cookies? Everybody, thank you for coming to the John Tyler History Forum. Uh, we have three of these a year. Um, the forum is sponsored by the History Department here. So that's myself. I'm John Kerman, Professor of History here. We have Frank Clackle. Uh, Dr. Clack is a professor of history, and then we have Greg Hansard uh, at the Chester campus. Can you hear us uh, at Chester? Yes, we can hear you. I'm going to turn it up a little bit, but we can hear you okay. All right, very good. Um, before I introduce your, uh, our speaker, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Clack say a few words about an opportunity for students who want to plan to transfer to DCU. Yeah, I figured we've got a, a group here that's captive audience, someone from DCU as well. Uh, so there's a new program that has just uh, come to fruition in the last year called Pathways to VCU. If you seven. are interested in you English, or English or foreign language or philosophy or religion, basically any of the humanities, this is a really awesome program. I have some brochures you can check out, but basically enter into a cohort at John Tyler, you're automatically enrolled to transfer to VCU. Well, it's going to work. Yeah, uh, to go to school, to go to class, and to automatic enrollment. Afterwards, if you're interested, I guess we go to the south. Hey guys, if you're on Zoom, you need to mute yourselves. If you're on Zoom, we're hearing you. So please mute your computers. Is that right, Robert? Yeah. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so we host three speakers per year for the John Tyler History Forum. Uh, last November, we had Dr. Mike Mesmer from VCU, also has taught here for many years, and he spoke on the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. That's the debate over whether we've entered a new geological mm -hmm. characterized by man's impact on the environment. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Brian Darty from VCU who can speak on the Battle over integration in Prince Edward County, Virginia. And then in April, then in April, we're going to have our own history instructor, Victoria uh, Glover. Hey guys, if you're on Zoom, please mute yourselves. We hear you. Thank you. All right, and then uh, in April, Victoria Glover is going to speak on her research investigating the events leading the Scottish Jacobites to side either with the Loyalists or the Patriots during the American Revolution. What determines which way they go? That's coming up in April, so we'll get you that date uh, very soon. So let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Dougherty. I'm really excited. I consider uh, Brian a personal friend. Uh, I really respect his research, and I'm so glad he's here. I'm very excited about this. Brian grew up right here in Chesterfield County. Uh, he went to Thomasdale High School, uh, got his PhD from William and Mary, um, and he's now an associate professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. His research focuses on the implementation of the 1954 decision Brown versus Board of Education here in Virginia, one of the leading experts uh, on the implementation uh, of civil rights legislation here in Virginia. Uh, at VCU, he teaches courses on uh, the South, uh, on the civil rights movement, on the history of Virginia, and on the history of the US since, since 1865. Now, a little bit of background. In 2008, uh, he co-edited a collection of essays examining school desegregation throughout the United States. In 2016, he published one of my favorite books, Keep On, Keeping On. Uh, it is a, the NAACP and the implementation of Brown versus Board of Education in Virginia. If you know very little about the civil rights movement in Virginia, this is a great place to start because he writes so well. He takes a complex topic and he makes it very, very manageable and very clear. All right, I'd highly recommend that book right there. And then this last year, uh, he published a book of essays uh, or I should say a book of documents, uh, co-authored a book of documents uh, entitled A Little Child Shall Lead Them, a documentary account of the struggle for school desegregation in Prince Edward County, Virginia. Uh, and that's what he's going to talk about today. And if you don't know what was going on in Prince Edward County, Virginia in the 50s, in the 1960s, it'll blow you away. All right, so this is, this is going to be really, really good stuff. Um, the other thing I'll say is Dr. Darity also regularly speaks to teachers. He leads workshops, all right? He's trying to get his research on the civil rights movement in Virginia down into the schools. That's really good stuff. Um, in fact, I just saw you got a grant, $170,000, working with an ODU professor to train 72 teachers this summer on the latest research on the civil rights movement in Virginia uh, and how we can implement that in the classrooms 
uh, in the elementary, middle, and high schools, right? Uh, finally, I'll say that uh, Dr. Darby is no stranger to John Tyler. Uh, some of you may know Dr. Elise Miller. She was a uh, excellent professor here for, for, for several years. Uh, she left to go to Florida a few years ago, but she did research on the Rosenwald schools in Virginia. These were schools that were established by Dr. Julius or by Julius Rosenwald. He was the CEO of Sears Roebuck and Company. And there were schools established to help. So, at least with that research, they did some papers together. They had conferences here. And so he's no stranger to John Tyler. So I welcome uh, Dr. Brian Dowdy. That was such a gracious introduction. I really appreciate the invitation, John. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you. And I appreciate you all taking the time to come out and listen to my research and the story of school desegregation in Virginia. It's, a, it's an important one. Uh, I'm a former high school teacher, excuse me, taught for many years down at Richard Bland College, a junior college in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, and then worked my way up to VCU. I enjoy teaching at all levels and uh, I really enjoy connecting history, what's happened in the past to what's going on in the present day. Um, so I hope you'll find this research not only interesting, but also relevant to, to the things that are going on around us. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Dr. Kern said I have about three hours to get through. All right. And there's a test afterwards, right? Okay. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. So let's turn our attention to the story. If we can pull up the screen. So these are the three books that Dr. Kern has already mentioned. I'm going to be focusing on the, the last of the three books, which just came out this summer. And so just to make sure everybody's familiar with where Prince Edward County is located, uh, here we are in Richmond. Uh, if you were to follow Hull Street all the way out into Southside, Virginia, Farmville is the county seat of Prince Edward County. Some of you might know where Longwood University is located or Hampton Sydney College. Both of them are located in Farmville. Do we have any, anyone here from Prince Edward County out of curiosity? So the Prince Edward County story uh, revolves around the schools in the county. And I'll start off by talking about what historians refer to as the Jim Crow era. Roughly from the late 1800s until about the mid 1900s, the mid 20th century. In Virginia, we had segregation throughout all aspects of life. Segregation means the separation of the races. All public facilities, including schools, were set up so that African Americans had a set of schools and white Virginians, white residents had a separate set of schools. All other aspects of life are also segregated. So swimming pools, beaches, amusement parks, hospitals, libraries, cemeteries, right? the entire structure of Virginia and all of the southern states was separate. It was supposed to be separate but equal. Right? You might remember the 1896 United States Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. As long as the facilities are roughly equal, separate is constitutional. It's not a violation of the law. Well, unfortunately for African Americans in Virginia, the system that was set up in the late 1800s and carrying over for the next five to six decades was anything but equal. The story in Prince Edward starts because the schools were not equal. Here you have a photograph of the white Farmville High School constructed, as you can see, in the late, late 1910s, early 1920s. It is a modern brick building, as you can see, with a large number of classrooms, I'd say eight, maybe 12 classrooms, had running water, had indoor heat, it had electricity, it has all the things that you might expect the school to have. It has an auditorium, cafeteria, library. Less than a mile across town is the high school for African-American students in Prince Edward County in the city of Farmville. This school was built about a decade later. It was not equal to the white school. 
The school does not have a cafeteria or a library. It was very quickly overcrowded. So when the building opened, it was established for 180 students. By the post-World War II period, the late 1940s, there were over 450 students enrolled at this school. They were teaching classes in parked school buses on the grounds, teaching classes, multiple classes in one room. As you can imagine, this is a very difficult circumstance for students and teachers and so forth. And so the African-American students in Prince Edward County grew frustrated with these inequities as had students all over the state of Virginia. They decide that they're going to go on strike. They're gonna boycott their school and seek help to construct, to press the school board and county officials to construct a new school for the African-American students that would be similar to or equal to the white high school just across town. The leader of this student strike is shown here on the right, right side of the photograph, Barbara Rose Johns, who was a, a, you know, a 16 year old high school student, very, very a successful student, um, uh, involved in a number of clubs and organizations at her school. She had had the opportunity to travel around Virginia to see white schools, to see black schools, and came to understand that the school that herself and her, her classmates were being educated in was not offering them the best opportunities for a successful future. In addition to the buildings themselves not being equal, I want you to understand that the course offerings were not equal, right? In the black high school, you might have one foreign language. In the white high school, you might be able to choose three or four, depending on the county that you looked at. The black, the black schools went for fewer months each year than the white schools did. The white schools had more advanced placement and honors courses to get college credit. Right? So it's not just the buildings that are unequal or inequitable. It's all aspects of this school system, including the transportation system. So the final straw that leads Barbara Johns to announce and plan and launch this boycott or student strike is this. The African-Americans were transported in the hand-me-down school buses. And one of the school buses transporting black students broke down on a set of railroad tracks. Several black students were killed in the resulting accident. And that was the final straw for Barbara Johns, who had been planning this strike for some time, to organize it in the spring of 1951, and then to launch this student strike. Photograph of some of the students involved, including here at the front of the screen, Dorothy Davis, who the lawsuit is going to be named after. She'll be one of about 120 plaintiffs in the case, and her name will be listed first on the court document. Now, these students, as I indicated, initially sought a new black high school, as you can see from one of their signs, one of their strike posters. They reached out to the NAACP. Now, the NAACP stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and it was created back in the early 1900s. By the 1940s and early 1950s, it was the leading civil rights organization in the United States, including in the southern states and in Virginia. There's a very strong Virginia State Conference of the NAACP, which means a headquarters of the organization, and active NAAC branches in all 100 counties of the state of Virginia. They reach out to the NAACP and specifically to its attorneys, its legal team, and they say, we've gone on strike. We want assistance to obtain a, a lawsuit to help us get a new, newly constructed black school in Farmville, Virginia. The NAACP responds and says, we would be happy to help you. However, we are no longer filing lawsuits that would just construct a new black school, but still leave segregation in place, meaning two school systems. Instead, we have now switched our priorities. We will help you file a lawsuit if you're willing to seek admission into the white schools in the county. If you're willing to argue that segregation is unconstitutional, segregation is, is not, um, it's not equal, and therefore argue that 
we should have integration in the public schools in Prince Edward County and that this decision will be applied throughout the country. So the NAACP makes this offer and the students go back to their parents. There's a whole series of mass meetings in the county to discuss this uh, choice. And in the end, they agree that yes, we will sign on as plaintiffs in a publicly filed document a lawsuit against the county and against eventually the state of Virginia already arguing that segregation in public education is a violation of the rights of African American students. And so this is a photograph of the lawsuit, as you can see, filed in late May 1951. Now, I will note that there was some hesitation in the county to take this step because such action was dangerous at the time. Barbara Rose Johns faces death threats. Her family faces a lot of hostility among white residents of the county and those from around the state of Virginia. Barbara eventually is sent out of state to live with family members for her protection. Other families who sign on to this lawsuit lose their jobs. Some are evicted from the properties that they were residing in. So it takes bravery and courage to file a lawsuit against the white officials in the county that you lived in in Virginia at the time. Now, one of the things that many people don't realize about Brown versus Board Education is that Brown versus Board Education was not one case. <coughs> Brown versus Board Education is actually five cases combined by the United States Supreme Court under the name Brown versus Board Education, but representing five different lawsuits that have been filed around the country, all arguing that segregation in public education was harmful to African American students and therefore a violation of their constitutional rights. So the lawsuits are filed in South Carolina, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Washington, DC, Prince Edward County, as I just explained, and the case name Topeka, Kansas. The Supreme Court bundles them together or combines them together, goes through the whole process of hearings, and then eventually, eventually issues its decision in the spring of 1954. They named the case after the Topeka case so that the southern states wouldn't feel like they were being targeted by the NAACP and by the Supreme Court. So these are the principal attorneys that handled Brown versus Board Education. They represent places all over the country. The most important are highlighted here at the center of the screen. Thurgood Marshall is the head of the NAACP's national legal team. So he lives in New York City where the organization was based and he works with NAACP attorneys all over the country. He will later go on to become the first African-American Supreme Court justice in American history in the late 1960s. To his left is Oliver Hill, a very important figure in Virginia civil rights the individual that Barbara Rose Johns and her classmates reached out to initially. Today, there's a federal court building in downtown Richmond named after Oliver Hill, a bridge in the city of Richmond named after Oliver Hill. He was head of the Virginia NAACP legal team. To the right of Thurgood Marshall is Spotswood Robinson, goes on to become a federal judge at, on his own, um, one of the sharpest legal minds of this generation. These two are the most important Virginia NAACP attorneys in Virginia, although I will say they worked with many other attorneys that were spread out all over the state. Now, Oliver Hill and Thurgood Marshall were best friends, lifelong best friends. They went to law school together. Thurgood Marshall graduates first in his class. Oliver Hill graduates second in his class. The two competed in a friendly, competitive way in law school and for decades thereafter. What that means is that whatever the national NAACP was doing, the Virginia NAACP knew about, cooperated with, and helped with. That makes Virginia very, very important to the implementation of Brown versus Board Education. Now, the Brown decision applies in states that either required segregation by law, which are the green states, or states that allowed segregation, allowed localities to decide if they wanted segregation. And these are the blue states, 
So the green states and the blue states are all affected by Brown versus Board education. The greatest resistance to Brown versus Board education is going to be in the former states of the Confederacy, right? The 11 Confederate states plus two states that were claimed by the Confederacy, but also by the Union. And that basically means most of these green states were going to be, were in fact upset about the school desegregation process. Now, Brown versus Board of Education is a very short decision. All it says in May of 1954 is that segregation is unconstitutional. It doesn't say how it would be implemented. It doesn't give any time frame or anything along those lines. What the court <laughs> decided to do was to hear additional arguments and then issue a follow-up decision the next spring. That follow-up decision is typically referred to as Brown II. It comes out almost exactly a year after Brown versus Board Education, and it outlines the implementation of Brown versus Board Education. Some of the principal points are here on the screen. So local school districts are the ones that were responsible for planning and bringing about school desegregation. That's important because in most of the southern states, these local school districts were opposed to Brown versus Board education and opposed to school desegregation. In fact, and this is a point that I will highlight, the vast majority of white Virginians were opposed to Brown versus Board education. I would estimate more than 90% were opposed to school desegregation. And so these local school boards were responding to the opposition that was evident in their communities, that means that when the Supreme Court makes them responsible, if they choose not to comply, then school desegregation is stalled. And in effect, that is what will happen. Now, the second point says that the Supreme Court allows various delays. If a school district said, oh, we're going to build a new school, it's going to take us some time to comply or if they want to do like a survey of the students, then that could give them, buy them some time. So the process is, is going to unfold in a fairly slow manner. There's no timeline for the start or the finish. finish. Instead, the Supreme Court issues this very vague language about time, speed, and so forth with all deliberate speed. And finally, the lower federal courts are going to handle litigation claiming noncompliance. So the federal court system has three levels. The Supreme Court is at the top. At the bottom are called federal district courts. And there's multiple federal district courts in every state. Virginia at the time had three. Then in the middle level are called the circuit courts of appeal. And at the time there were 10 around the country. So if there is an African-American family that says our local school board is not complying with Brown versus Board of Education. They're not doing anything. They don't want to integrate the school. Then that family has to file a lawsuit against the local school district in order to get the process beginning. That lawsuit is going to have to work its way through these three levels of the federal court, which takes some time before the school desegregation process will unfold. It's also worth noting that these lower federal courts are staffed by people from the states in which they serve. So in Virginia at the time, all of the federal district court judges were white men from Virginia, most of whom believed in segregation. Brown II, therefore, is largely considered a setback to the end of NCP. This is not a favorable decision for them. And it meant that although Brown versus Board Education is monumental, the process of actually integrating schools is going to be quite slow and laborious. And the burden for integrating schools falls back on African-American parents and their children. So how does the school desegregation process unfold? Here you have a map of the South three years after Brown versus Board Education. Where you see compliance is what historians refer to as the Upper South, right? the states that border the North. In these states, you do see voluntary compliance by school boards and local officials. 
So Delaware and Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, Oklahoma. In these areas, school boards, for whatever reason, they want to comply with the law or they feel that they can actually save money by merging two separate school systems into one school system, or because there are few African-American students in their local district, so they figure it won't be a major upheaval to combine school systems. So they begin the process of school desegregation almost immediately, and it does not require additional lawsuits. The remainder of the southern states refuse to comply on their own, including Virginia, and it's going to require NAACP lawsuits working through those federal courts to bring about school desegregation, including in these states where you see it's already beginning, like Tennessee and North Carolina. And so what happens after Brown II is that the burden, as I mentioned, falls upon Black parents and their children here you have an African-American parent with a young child. He wants to enroll this child in the local white school. It might be closer to their house. It might be because it has more class offerings or better facilities, higher teacher pay. All of these things benefited, uh, benefited white students at the time. So he goes to try to register. School officials would refuse him admission. And then this black parent goes to the NAACP, tells them what's happened and the NAACP typically would agree and file a lawsuit against this school district. After it goes through the federal courts, eventually the federal courts begin to order the admission of small numbers of black children into all white schools in the southern states, and that's the beginning of the school desegregation process. I will add, we do not see white students seeking admission into the black schools. So the process is always a one-way street of black students being admitted into formerly all-white schools. Now, you will note, I hope, that the gentleman in the back of this photograph is holding a bat. Deliberately. He's sending a message to this parent that his child is not welcome in the school, that there may well and often were consequences, repercussions, punishments for this sort of behavior, challenging segregation in the southern states. It's a, it's, a, it's a step that takes a lot of courage, to put it mildly. So the NAACP attorneys in Virginia are shown on the screen with Oliver Hill in the middle. He is the head of this team. These attorneys are spread out all over the state. Fredericksburg, Newport News, Norfolk, Roanoke, Danville, and so when local parents in those communities want legal assistance, they will go to these NAACP attorneys and say, I've been denied admittance in the local school. I want to integrate or desegregate that school. I want you to help me with legal action. I also want to add that these attorneys handle all aspects of civil rights issues. African Americans are struggling not just with segregated schools, as I mentioned, but voting disenfranchisement. They are prevented from voting in the southern states. You guys are familiar with the poll tax, the literacy test, and other mechanisms to disenfranchise black voters. They're living in segregated neighborhoods by law. Black neighborhoods oftentimes did not have paved streets or lighting, regular sewage pickup, and so forth. They are also dealing with problems in health care, access to equal health care, police brutality, and criminal justice problems. And on down the line, I want you to understand, this is an entirely inequitable society. And these NAACP attorneys were trying to break down all aspects of those inequities, not just schools. Now, as I indicated, most white Virginians were opposed to Brown versus Board Education. And that included residents, citizens, as well as political leaders. My friend Ed Peoples took this photograph, I believe it's 1960 or 1961. Before he passed away, he used to always joke with me, Brian, looks like a Tea Party sign, doesn't it? This is 50 years before the Tea Party, right? But the sentiment is the same. White residents, in this case in Powhatan County, were upset that the federal government, the United States Supreme Court, was uh, influencing the Southern way of life, in this case, its ability to segregate its schools as most Virginians, most white Virginians wanted. 
all across the South, after Brown versus Board of Education, we see the growth, the revival, the creation of new organizations committed to white supremacy and racial segregation. The most famous is the Klan, and you will see a re revival of the Klan throughout this time period. Not as strong in Virginia as in the Deep South states like Mississippi, Alabama, and so forth. You'll see other organizations created. One popular one or one commonly known one is the Citizens Councils, the White Citizens Councils. In Virginia, the most important organization created not coincidentally in Farmville, right, where that lawsuit is filed in 1951, is known as the Defenders of State Sovereignty and Individual Liberty. And as you can see, this organization based itself on the idea of states' rights the states have the right to segregate their schools. The states have the right to establish who can vote, so on and so forth, even if they are doing so in a, in a racial manner, a racist manner. I highlight that it's created in Farmville because Farmville now, since 1951, is part of, it's integrated into this struggle over civil rights. It's, it's been dealing with this issue for several years already, and it's going to continue to have to struggle with this issue for many years to come. They get the name, incidentally, from a statue, a Confederate monument in downtown Farmville, right across the street from Longwood University, created and constructed in 1900, long after the Civil War, when white Virginians were actually revising the history of the Civil War and portraying the Civil War not as over slavery, but over states' rights. It's that these monuments, which we're dealing with now, we're talking about now, street names and building names after Confederate generals and so on and so forth, right? These relics of the past, they strongly affected this period of school desegregation and massive resistance. On the left-hand side, you see a newspaper that the Defenders of State Sovereignty published for almost a decade. You can read copy of this newspaper downtown at the Library of Virginia. The other national or statewide newspapers, I should say, almost, almost all of them opposed school desegregation, the white newspapers, I should say. The, the state's leading newspapers at the time were the, uh, the Richmond News Leader and the Richmond Times Dispatch. They were combined at the time. One came out in the morning and the other in the afternoon. This photograph shows the editor of the Richmond News Leader James Jackson Kilpatrick was a staunch segregationist. He goes on to become a leader in the conservative movement, the neoconservative, the, the revival of the Republican Party in the southern states, and he adamantly opposes the desegregation of public schools. African American newspapers, I should note, were strongly supportive of Brown versus Board of Education and wanted to see the implementation of Brown throughout the state. Now, the most important political figure in the state of Virginia at the time is on the screen here. One time governor back in the 20s who restructures Virginia government to give him extensive control over the entire state, becomes head of the Virginia Democratic Party in the 1920s and very, very important figure in Virginia politics throughout this period. He is the one who coins the phrase massive resistance to school desegregation. He wants Virginia to lead like it had during the Civil War. He wants Virginia to lead this resistance. And he goes from Virginia to Washington, D.C. to the United States Senate, where he serves for 32 years in the Senate, very powerful figure. He pushes for resistance in the state of Virginia. The state prop, uh, adopts about 25 segregation laws in the, in the summer of 1956 to try to prevent school desegregation from happening in Virginia and also targets the NAACP attorneys and others who were pushing for compliance. All of this comes to a head in Virginia in 1958. That fall, a series of NAACP lawsuits in the state of Virginia that were filed in 1956, get favorable decisions by the Supreme Court, by the federal courts, I should say. They don't actually go to the Supreme Court. And the federal courts order Virginia to begin the school desegregation process in the fall of 1958. These are the attorneys that handled those cases. When it reaches 
And this is Virginia in the fall of 1958. You can see there is no school desegregation in Virginia at that time, nor is there school desegregation in the Deep South. But other neighboring states had already begun to comply. That fall, uh, the governor of Virginia closes schools in three localities rather than have them desegregate as Brown versus Board Education had ordered. Those localities are Charlottesville, Norfolk, and Warren County, which is up near Winchester, Virginia. As you can see, this is national news. The governor also sets aside taxpayer money, public finances, to give to the parents of children in the closed schools, remembering because black children are, are trying to integrate white schools, it means that only white schools are closed. When those schools are closed, those parents get taxpayer money to create private academies that would be segregated as a way of avoiding Brown versus Board education. And so all across Virginia in 1958, 1959, 1960, as this process slowly expands, you see the creation of private schools using taxpayer money, which eventually will be ruled unconstitutional, but most of these private schools still exist in the present day. It has a very profound impact on public education. Well, eventually the NAACP files litigation against the school closings, this whole process against the governor, and the federal courts say that no, you can't avoid Brown versus Board even by closing schools. And so they renew these orders for compliance. And in February of 1959, this is five years after Brown versus Board of Education, we have the first school desegregation in Virginia. It takes place in Arlington and Norfolk initially. Small numbers of African-American children admitted into all white schools. The fall goes to Charlottesville. As you can see, it's national news. The reporters in the background. And I want you to understand that for these black children, in many cases, they're the only African-American student in these white schools. This is a very difficult process. They talk about sitting in the front of the room, running their hands through their hair and having covered in spitballs, walking down the hall and getting tripped, books knocked out of their hands, right? They talk about being called all sorts of names and threatened and sometimes getting into fights. Having their grades go from all A's because they were chosen carefully to C's and D's. Raising your hand and the teacher will never call on you. All because of resistance to change. Now, what the NAACP seeks after this begins in February of 1959 is to expand the process. In Virginia, it will take lawsuits. So additional lawsuits are going to be filed in 1958, 1959, 1960 against more localities, Fredericksburg, Danville, right? You get the idea. The NAACP wants more localities to desegregate their schools, and they want more African-American uh, students admitted to these various schools. So the process is going to slowly expand in Virginia until the late 1960s. Maybe I'll give that lecture in a future forum. But in 1968, we have a case from New Kent County, Virginia, that speeds up the school integration process in Virginia and other southern states. It's a slow process until then, and then we start to see some pretty substantial change. But we need to go back to Prince Edward County. Because what Prince Edward County does when it faces federal court orders to comply with Brown versus Board of Education is it becomes the only school district in the South to close its schools for an extended period of time rather than comply with Brown versus Board of Education. Prince Edward County officials do this on their own. So it's not the governor closing the schools, which had already been ruled illegal. It's the Board of Supervisors in the county closing the schools. And what they did was they cut all funding for the public schools from the county budget. And they told white parents, take that money and create a segregated academy in Prince Edward County where all the white students will continue to go to school. So all the white students get taxpayer money and they get money from the state to create what's known as Prince Edward Academy 
1959, it opens its doors. It still exists. In the 1980s, it was, or excuse me, 1990s, it was renamed Fuqua School. But it's still there, same buildings and so forth. And it is still a largely white school. It does have to admit some students in the 1980s because the IRS threatens to take its funding, its tax exempt status. But it's a mostly white segregated school in the county. African American children don't have that choice. Their choices are to either leave the county to be educated elsewhere or to remain in the county and go without school for five years. So the fortunate ones go to school in the county next door with family or friends to Buckingham, the Nottaway, the Appomattox County, to Cumberland County. Others take advantage of civil rights organizations who offer to help and they go to live with families in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, far, far from their families, oftentimes in very, very foreign environments, living with families that they don't know. About 1,700 or so, somewhere in the range of 1,700 students go without an education during the school closings in Prince Edward County. Those students, let's say you're in the second grade, you're maybe seven years old when the schools are closed. The schools reopen five years later, you're 12 years old. Are you going to go back to the second grade? Maybe. Many don't. This affects the rest of their lives. So the Prince Edward School Foundation, this is the private organization that creates Prince Edward County. This is their justification for the closings, the justification for the academy, the threat to that liberty. They portray themselves as the victims. Their liberty is under threat because they wanted to segregate. They felt that they had states' rights to discriminate they don't want the federal government telling them that civil rights or human rights is more important than their personal individual liberties. Well, this generates a lot of attention, as you might imagine. This is, again, the only, only district in the South to do this. And so you have Martin Luther King comes to the county, meets with African-American students locked out of schools. Here you have a photograph of the national head of the NAACP. Roy Wilkins comes from New York meets with Oliver Hill, and this is the local civil rights leader, the most important African-American leader in the county, L. Francis Griffin, Reverend L. Francis Griffin. It leads to a growing number of boycotts in the county and strikes and protests against the school closing. The NAACP gets increasingly active in, New Kent, excuse me, in Prince Edward County as this story unfolds. A group of students, high school students and college students, some of whom come back to the county in the summertime, protest against the downtown businesses, which are also segregated. One movie theater doesn't allow black patrons. The other allows black patrons to sit upstairs in the balcony only. So they protest against the school closings as well as the segregation in downtown businesses, all sorts of picketing in the county, and the legal action also continues in the federal courts. So here on the far right is L. Francis Griffin, the black community leader. Here are a couple of the NAACP attorneys, this gentleman increasingly well known in the state of Virginia, Samuel Tucker. And I'm not sure if anybody in the room would recognize this young man. Anyone? This is Henry Marsh, first black mayor of the city of Richmond, went on to become a member of the Virginia State Senate for decades, recently retired and a week ago, City of Richmond School Board renamed George Mason Elementary, which he attended, Henry L. Marsh Elementary School. Much deserved. 2008, the state of Virginia constructs a civil rights memorial down on the Capitol grounds. Some of you may see this. It's right next to the General Assembly building. Here you've got Barbara Johns at the front, at the front and center with some of her fellow students. On one side of the monument, you've got L. Francis Griffin, the black community leader. And on the other side, the attorneys, Oliver Hill and Spotswood Robinson. So I'm going to talk just for a couple minutes about the book, and then I will take any questions that you all have. So what's unique about this book is that I didn't really write it. It's a collection of documents that tell this story, primary documents. So the documents come from the time period, right? 
myself and my co-editor, we wrote the introductions to the book, introductions to each chapter, introductions to each reading, and we wrote questions for each reading. It's really a teaching tool or someone who wants to know the story, but not from a historian, from the people who were involved, right? We really made it a, a high priority to include all perspectives on the struggle over school integration in the county. So it's not just the African-American perspective, which I personally think is most important at this point of telling the story, but it also includes a segregationist perspective so that you can understand why did white Virginians, why did white residents of Prince Edward County feel so strongly about segregation in their schools? Why did they resist so intently? It includes stories from the young, the old, men, women, people of all different backgrounds. We wanted to get a comprehensive telling of this story so that you're not hearing it from me or anyone else. You're hearing it from people that were there, that experienced it firsthand, that knew what was going on. On the left-hand side, a description of the types of documents. So we've got some speeches, some journal entries, newspaper, magazine articles, court records, about two dozen photographs. And then on the right-hand side, the beginnings of the table of contents. The story starts back in the late 1800s during the Jim Crow era. W.E.B. Du Bois actually goes to visit the county in the late 1800s. I find that fascinating. And then into the strike era, we've got handwritten account from Barbara Johns' diary, highlighting just a few over Oliver Hill's speech to the General Assembly short after Brown, shortly after Brown versus Board of Education, one of the most powerful speeches that he has ever given, in my opinion, very powerful. Martin Luther King's account of visiting Prince Edward County and what was going on. Introduction to the book, uh, into the, introduction to a book about the schools that were set up briefly in the county by Robert Kennedy, the Kennedy administration's in power. And then toward the end of the book, there is a huge debate in the 1990s in the county about what to do with the school building. It was no longer in use. The county board of supervisors wanted to designate it as surplus uh, property so that they could sell it, presumably for a fast food restaurant, like right across the street or something along those lines. Fortunately, the new editor to the newspaper comes in and says, why don't you just throw the Liberty Bell into the river? Or, you know, why don't you just destroy other aspects of American history? This is central to the history of Virginia, the history of the civil rights era. We need to preserve this building. And fortunately, that's what happened. Today, the Moton School stands as the R.R. Moton Museum. It's the only civil rights museum in the state of Virginia. It's a fascinating place to visit. It is set up just as it was in 1951 when the school strike began. I highly encourage you to take a visit sometime. And that is the conclusion of my talk. I really appreciate you guys coming. As I said, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Please. Is your title referring to a specific child? It is specifically referring to Barbara Johns as the strike leader. Uh, it's a quote from the Bible, if you're familiar with that. Um, and Barbara Johns goes on, you know, as I mentioned, she's forced to leave the state for her own protection. She goes to live with an uncle for some time. Um, she passes away without much fame or notoriety, but in recent years, she, her role has been increasingly recognized in Brown versus Board Education. So I, I showed you the statue, but directly across the street is the Virginia Office of the Attorney General of the State of Virginia. It was renamed, say three years ago now, Barbara Johns Building. So we started to see her get some of the recognition that I think she deserves. Incidentally, this is the only of the five Brown versus Board of Education lawsuits that was initiated by children, by youth persons. Good question. The sense of the demographics of Prince Edward County in the 50s and 60s. It's such like a small and rural, but like how many people are talking, percentage white? So the percentage is roughly 50 50. Um, it's slightly more white than black, but within five percentage points. It's a pretty evenly divided county. Um, in terms of the overall popula population of the county, I have to estimate, but I want to say, I, I read this recently, I want to say it was in the range of 15,000 residents maybe between 10 and 15,000 residents. So it is a rural, fairly isolated county, but the, 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 the county seat of Farmville 
is a fairly large, uh, you know, uh, area township within that whole region. So people would come from neighboring county to the farm bill itself. Yeah. Was there any attempt by the state to try to rectify or correct the loss of education for the students in terms of getting their GEDs or anything like that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, in 2004, on the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, the state of Virginia set up a scholarship fund called the Brown Scholarship Fund, which allows anyone who is affected by the school closings in Virginia to obtain funding for two years of education to finish up a GED or an associate's degree or college, take additional college credits to try and graduate from school. We've unmuted the other site, so if Chester has a question or anybody else listening in. Any questions over here? I was curious about Richmond, but um, did the Richmond public schools um, maintain the same outlook as the um, as the county? Did they open up for um, desegregation, or did they stay closed as well? So the Richmond public schools are not closed. The school board does resist Brown versus Board Education. The NAACP filed a lawsuit against the city of Richmond in 1958, and the city of Richmond begins the school desegregation process in 1960. So one year after those photographs where I showed initial desegregation in Charlottesville and Norfolk and so forth, Richmond begins the process. It initially starts with two students at Chandler Junior High School in Northside, and then the, the number of African-American students in desegregated schools in Richmond will slowly grow in subsequent years, all the way up until the late 1960s, when you'll see the, the pace increase dramatically. I was just going to say a, a fantastic presentation and um, yeah, very, very, uh, very informative. And what I always like to tell my students is, you know, we're surrounded by um, U.S. history all around us, and you've really brought to light, you know, another location uh, to add to that. And I've been to the Moden Museum, and my tour guide uh, was one of the individuals who was affected by that uh, that that five year year gap there, and he never graduated. So. Um, you, I'm sure through your research, you've done a ton of oral histories and, and things like that where you can get firsthand accounts. Uh, yes, I have. And in, in, in Farmville, because many of these students were quite young at the time, even though this was 50 so years ago, uh, many of them are still alive. They are still able to tell their stories and make sure that this doesn't happen again, to make sure that the lessons of um, these outdated ideologies are learned and and that we, you know, move forward as a as a state, um, recognizing that um, skin color is it's only skin deep, right? It's not what defines us. It's not what defines our characters. It's it's not anything that should separate us, right? We all have the same wants, goals, desires, and so forth. And so it's really important that we learn the lessons of this mistreatment, um, and 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 reject those ideologies as we move forward and hopefully be able to make amends for some other aspects of this segregated society. One of the things that I always highlight to my students, African Americans, when they were slaves in Virginia for roughly 300 years, um, I should a little bit less than 300 years, 250 or so years, they could not own property. Slaves could not own property. So all of the best land in Virginia is owned by white families in the 1600s, 1700s, into the 1800s. And even during the Jim Crow system, when slavery is over, it was very difficult for African Americans to obtain property and wealth and inheritance and so forth. And so we have tremendous economic disparities in our country, in our state. And, and that impacts us in 2019, 2020, moving forward. Those disparities are not because of any sort of racial differences. Those disparities are because of our history. It's important to know that history and to recognize how it impacts us in the present day. So if there's one lesson that you take away today, I hope that that's it. Yes, please. So how do we best dispute uh, the social norms now to those that are pessimistic? Oh boy, that's a, 
I don't know if that's a question for a historian. Uh, I'll give it my best shot. How do we challenge those who are hesitant to change? Well, you know, we're in the midst of a pretty substantial debate over facts and truth and honesty and evidence. And I would argue that there is lots of evidence out there that would show every aspect of the story that I've told today. So including in this, the book that I'm talking about, all the documents are there for you to see, to read, to share, to point out to other people. Um, in my other two books, all the research is done in, in archives, looking at documents and newspapers and, and, mm -hmm. and records that exist that show that this is not speculation. This is not some sort of opinion or guess, right? These are facts and that I think is incredibly important in the present day when when people are confusing facts and opinions and people I think are oftentimes deliberately dishonest about their um, perspective. That needs to be challenged. And I think that um, historical evidence is one way to do that. So I noticed on one of the slides, um, like little bullet points that said riots throughout the Um, so there is violent resistance in a number of localities to the school desegregation process. Um, you might expect that violence in a state like Mississippi, where I taught high school for several years, or Alabama, but there was also violence in Delaware, Tennessee, um, Texas. So there was a lot of, uh, of white um, you know, support for the segregated system. Whites benefited from this segregated system, and there was resistance to challenging that system. Um, sometimes that resistance manifested itself in very extreme and detrimental ways. So, yeah. All right, I hope you guys get a sense of how just how long and laborious this whole process was. Sometimes we read the textbooks, we jump from Plessy versus Ferguson, which says separate but equal is okay. In 1896, the Brown versus Board of Education, schools are integrated. The, the NAACP is working for decades to build the legal foundations to do Brown versus Board of Education. And think of all the man hours, all the lawsuits that have to be put into place just to try to get Brown versus Board of Education implemented, right? And that's the story that he's presenting in his books right here. I and mean, this is just huge, huge work. And you can't imagine how, how hopeless it must have seemed at times to people. And then take away the, the courage these people have to be the only black student in a school and to go there and to sit there and be beaten up and to be talked down to and to be harassed. You have to have empathy. That's what historians have to do. You have to have empathy. But what's also important is to understand all sides. And that's, you know, uh, it's, not just, it's not just the black sources, it's the white sources, you know, all sides of this debate. We have to understand what everybody's thinking. But... I think that's great. Uh, let's thank Dr. Dory for his presentation. Um, did anybody, everybody sign in? Make sure you sign in with your teacher's name before you leave so you get credit for being here. Take some cookies on the way out, right? I was up at midnight making those chocolate chip cookies for you guys. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to